Oh, goodness, so many people got out of bed to see me speak. I better say something interesting. Um, I'm going to start my talk with a question, which is how many people saw this movie, the right one, when it came out in 1977? Right. Well, you're going to appreciate this perhaps more than some other people, because I want to talk about some things that happened a long, long time ago in the history of computing. So the history of computing is very short, um, but a long, long time ago. It seems, when we talk about computing, that things are ancient. If you mention a mainframe to some people, they're like, wow, that was so long ago, you know, it can't possibly be relevant. And this talk is really about relevance. And I got the idea for this talk mainly because a few weeks ago, Douglas Engelbart, who's the man in this image here, died, and he gave a demonstration in 1968 of video conferencing, chat, collaborative editing, clicking on links, I mean, everything that we do, really. Um, and this is now referred to as the mother of all demos. And it's on YouTube. You can go watch it. It's an hour and 40 minutes. Um, it is a bit odd to watch because it's all on film and kind of old-fashioned, but you'd be stunned if you sit and watch it where he's interactively saving files and chatting with people in video conferencing. And it was particularly poignant to me because this is about the time I was born. And I began to think, well, wait a minute, if around the time I was born all of this had already been thought up, uh, what's new? You know, what has actually happened in my lifetime? Because as innovators, we think we keep making new stuff. And what if it wasn't quite true? And I began to think about all the things that you know, I've seen invented. And then over a time, if you've been programming for a long time, you start to see patterns recur. And the more I thought about this, the more I got a really bad feeling about it. Um, like some stuff had sort of perhaps was repeating itself a bit more than I wanted to happen. So I thought I'd go back and look at some of the things that have actually been invented uh, that are apparently absolutely new. Now, cloud computing, of course, is the latest thing and has never been invented before, um, except for in 1966. Um, <laughs> There's a wonderful book which is called The Challenge of the Computer Utility. And uh, you can, you can, it's very cheap to get it on Amazon. It's like 50 cents or something. This book describes exactly what we live through today. Uh, you have utility computing. It talks about how it was going to be implemented uh, and what it would take to be done. And it wasn't at all a pipe dream because within a few years, uh, people had service bureaus and off they were going. Um, so then, of course, big data, that's absolutely brand new as well, except, uh, of course, it's not. Um, I gave a talk at Stratoconf last year about big data in 1955. Uh, there was a real big data project in 1955, which was to work out the distance between all the railway stations in England. This was really needed. Um, and that's just Dijkstra's algorithm, but uh, with about 12 million points to calculate. And uh, they only had 2K of memory, and they didn't have Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they had to invent everything. And if you can see that there's on the O'Reilly channel. You can see that talk. So you know, I've got this little high water mark in the corner here. 1968, we've got some things have been invented by. Well, of course, virtual machines. What could be more you know, new than that? Well, um, not really, because the virtual machines had been invented uh, by IBM, uh, completely implemented in the System 360 by 1967. So the hypervisor, even the term hypervisor was there. This is a System 360. Uh, that's actually, I think, my haircut still uh, was fashionable. <laughs> Um, so hypertext, of course, hypertext is brand new, isn't it? Uh, well, 1945, Bush uh, posited a machine called the Memex uh, using microfilm and motors by the look of things. Of course, that's not really a good uh, point to think about because that hasn't been implemented. So what about clickable links? So that's got to be new. I remember when Mosaic came out. I think that was 1967, wasn't it, with the light pen? Um, so this is actually a machine at Brown University uh, where then this woman is clicking on something on the screen to retrieve some information. Um, and so, you know, every time you think about all this new stuff, you have to remember this, it was all done in black and white before you were around. Um, markup languages, obviously markup languages, they're, they're really new. Well, IBM had the generalized markup language, the GML, which became SGML, which became HTML. Uh, that was in the 60s. Um, and this image here is actually from the early 80s from the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, fiber optic networking, okay, that's pretty cool stuff, isn't it? So that was around 66. Um, this, is the, this is the patent for data networking using fiber optics. Um, went to buy a German guy. Uh, so, okay, okay, what about Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi, that's pretty new too. Does anybody want to take a stab at when Wi-Fi was, first wireless networking was? Well, Tesla, of course, but actually really working 1971 in Hawaii with Aloha Net. Um, 
wide area. And what's interesting about AlohaNet is that it begat something we use all the time, which is Ethernet. Um, and that was invented so recently, it was 1973. Uh, this is the original Ethernet card. If you go to the Smithsonian, you can see this. This is about as good soldering as I do as well. So, um, but this is the original one that, that was done at Xerox. And uh, okay, SSDs. Now SSDs are you know, obviously a brand new technology invented about 1976. Um, and just as an aside, I wished we named products like this now. You know, rather than naming them after Hawaiian Islands or random words, nothing sounds better to me than data RAM bulk core. I want one of those. <laughs> I mean, we need to go back to that. Um, but this was 1976. You could replace your spinning disk with one of these gigantic. To give you an idea, that thing is about that big. Um, so it is a little less portable. Um, all right. So what about some other things? You, I know you're sitting there. Some of you thinking, well, come on, come on. Don't be ridiculous. What about all these things like instruction pipelining and branch prediction and uh, prefetching. In fact, all of that was done by IBM, basically. And if you're interested in the history of computing, it is well worth going and reading about two companies, Cray and IBM on the System 360, because they did a tremendous amount of stuff that we do today, uh, albeit a bit slower. Um, so all these machines in the 60s and 70s did all of these amazing things. The IBM Stretch, which in 1961, the second machine that was made there was sold to an organization called the National Security Agency. Um, and that machine was doing complete branch prediction and actually executing multiple branches simultaneously and then rolling back as it needed to. So we got up to 1976. Um, we haven't quite hit episode four yet. Into networking, well, all of that had already been done by that point as well. Chat, file transfers, email, RPCs, the whole lot had been done. Oh, uh, the GUI. Obviously, we didn't have GUIs. Uh, so uh, has anybody, did anyone else here use the Xerox 80? 10, no, that was a wonderful machine. That actually had, yeah, very good. So that was a really nice machine. It actually had graphics and things you could click on. And then two years later, there was this abomination, the Apple Lisa. Um, and at that point, we reached, well, I get close to my high watermark, which is the 80s. Uh, 83, we had TCP IP. Uh, all of the major programming language paradigms were out. Functional programming was done. Um, Object-oriented programming, that had been done. I mean, it, all the languages were done by the 80s. Concurrent programming, there's nothing new here. Uh, 70s and, and early 80s again. Event-driven programming, every time people talk about things like Node.js and they talk about events, I'm like, seriously? This is not very new, you know? I mean, PL1 had it in 66, Visual Basic had it. Uh, there's a lot here to learn. Declarative language, SQL, this was all 70s. Uh, I hope I'm depressing you at this point. The high watermark is Return of the Jedi. OK, once you get to Return of the Jedi, it's all downhill from there. Um, there's nothing after that that's interesting at all. But it's roughly, I mean, roughly, if you go back and you can do your own Wikipedia search, that a tremendous amount of what we do today is repeats of things that had been done, obviously faster and better. So what are the, what are the implications of this? I and mean, what does this really mean? Suppose you, suppose you accept that it's true, what I say about this. Well, I think the first implication, and I don't have a slide for this, is that the entire foundation for software patents is sand, basically. Because if it's all been done, if you, just, if you start patenting new things, you're really patenting old things. And we've seen this happen repeatedly. Um, but more importantly than that, the thing that you're likely doing has actually been done before. And that might seem depressing, but actually I think it's the most wonderful thing ever. Because it means that an education in computer science is worth something. And it means you should go and get one. So it's often the case that you know, we think we're inventing things, and you'll find out that before, work has been done in this area. Now, we can do it faster. We can improve it. But there's a lot to learn from what's been done before. And computer science is a small enough field that you can have a hope of learning it. You know, if I said uh, mathematics, uh, you should go learn all of mathematics, you, know, you, wouldn't, you would be here forever doing it. But computer science, you can go do it. So I think it's worth looking at when you're th in thinking of something new to do, what can you learn from past things? And not to be afraid of things like you know, the data RAM bulk core or mainframe systems, where a tremendous amount of real original work was done. The other implication is that we're in this incredible age of productivity. Be thankful that you don't have to invent Dijkstra's algorithm like they had to do for the railway project in 1955. I mean, that was a tremendous amount of work for them even to come up with the algorithm. We're now living in a place where we've got all these machines. We have this incredible foundation of, of technology and of ideas that we can build on. And we're now able to link it all together. And of course, we've seen that, particularly with, with uh, Web 2.0, 
where people would be able to build services tremendously rapidly, and particularly thanks to open source, of course, because the software is available as well as the ideas. And so we're living through this age, but there's a problem. And I think when you look at this history, there is one thing we have not really done well, which is conquer unreliability. I mean, our software is unreliable. Um, our hardware is unreliable, but we don't notice because the software typically patches the hardware. I'm a software engineer, so that would obviously be my view. Um, so we have not conquered it, and we haven't conquered it right from the very beginning. In, 18, in the early 1840s, Ada Lovelace was working with Charles Babbage in England on the analytical engine, which is his first computer, and they wrote a first computer program, and then Ada Lovelace wrote this letter to Babbage, and she says, think of my horror, what she'd found was a bug. This is the first program ever written and it didn't work, right? And she says, think of my horror over which I have been spending infinite patience and pains. Can you imagine? This is the first program, and you imagine what a pain it was to write it. And it's seriously wrong in one or two points. And in fact, they go back and forth debugging this thing until it doesn't work. We basically haven't got much better since then. Um, it, Grace Hopper, uh, another very important woman in computer science, uh, has stuck this bug. This is also in the Smithsonian. Uh, it's a physical bug. It's a moth that was in a relay in uh, the Harvard Mark I, and they debugged it. And she actually popularized the term debugging by, you know, she removed this bug. But bugs were well known in software at that point. Um, in the UK, Morris Wilkes, who worked on a thing called EDSAC, um, he has this wonderful quote where he says, I can remember the exact instance when I realized that a large part of my life from then on was going to be spent in finding mistakes in my own programs. <laughs> Could, could you just imagine the horror of that? They just got computing, they just got machines that were really usable, and suddenly they realized that the problem was going to be the programmers. Well, this carried on. I was at Kepler's bookstore in Menlo Park in the 90s, and Donald Knuth was there, and somebody asked him, which programming language do you prefer, Java or C++? And he just replied, which has the better debugger? It's like you know, all these arguments about languages and you know, what paradigm are you using? It's like, well, I, the real problem is I'm going to have to debug the thing. So I think this is related to what I call Turing's curse, which is the, uh, the title of this talk, which is in 1936, in Alan Turing's paper on the Entscheidungs problem, he proved this very important um, result, which is that you can't write a program that will determine if some other program will halt, will, will not go into an infinite loop. That's a fundamental truth. You cannot write a general program that will do that. You can't feed it a program and say, hey, is my, pro is my program going to stop? Um, and he did it for mathematical reasons, but it gives you a very uneasy feeling that, that one of those, I've got a really bad feeling about this moments, because what it tells you is there are limits to what uh, computers can do. On the other hand, I've always thought it was quite a positive result, because it meant that humans might actually have some utility at some point, at least for debugging things, because machines were not going to be able to do absolutely everything. Um, but it is a kind of a cursed world where there are certain things machines provably are not going to be able to do for us. So what do we do about this? If you're here today thinking, I want to innovate in some area, you know, what should you do? If you accept my thesis that everything's been done before, um, obviously you could go out and build an incredibly successful company like Facebook, uh, you know, which I'm not quite sure what they do, but um, you know, they use all this stuff, right? Um, but the other thing is, if you're, if you're doing something fundamental, and I think that's what the open source world is often very good at, is building fundamental things, you know, new languages, new frameworks, new, new ideas. I think there's one area which is unreliability, which is where it would be good to spend some time. And I'd particularly like you to do it before I get any older so that debuggers get better for me. So if I could just, this is entirely selfish, I just want people to work on this problem. So I think what would be good is to work on reliability. I mean, this is an area which we have not conquered at all, which is how do we help programmers make fewer mistakes? And if they do make mistakes, how do they find their mistakes? Now, we've made some attempts at this, right? Test-driven de development. Uh, we do have debuggers. We do have tracing mechanisms. But fundamentally, if you go back and you think, up until 1983, all of these amazing things have been invented, right? The internet had been invented, solid-state disks and hypervisors and incredible processor architectures. And we're still pretty much like Ada Lovelace saying, Think of my horror when I discover that this program I wrote doesn't work, and we're still there. So please, go out and come up with something that makes my life easier before episode seven comes out. <laughs> Thank you very much.